Hi there, welcome to your second lecture on the Northern Song. And today what we're going to look at is the influence of Emperor, Emperor Hui Song, who's the last emperor of the Northern Song. He rules from 1100 to 1126 at the height of the Song Dynasty's kind of power and reach. However, unfortunately for the Song Dynasty, Emperor Hui Song, who was the grand, uh, grandson uh, or great-grandson of the founding emperor of this dynasty, kind of... Um, I would compare him a little bit to Louis the Sixteenth. You know, he's a guy who is, or Louis the Fifteenth even, a guy who's really into art, a guy who's really into parties, a guy who really likes to read and study, and he's particularly into the arts. And so he doesn't spend, and he's he lives a very extravagant life because that's sort of what he was raised to be was a, a guy who was erudite and educated and into painting. Um, and not really into affairs of state. And so over the course of the 25 years or 26 years that he was in power, he neglects statecraft in order to focus on the court. And he kind of has a reputation in Chinese history of being a very bad emperor simply because he ignored developments in, uh, in the politics going on around him. And so the Jurchen, um were able to come in and conquer the Sung dynasty and basically um, the, what remained of the Sung court had to flee from the from their capital to the south where they set up shop as the southern Sung dynasty after 1127. Uh, but Emperor Wei Tsung was taken captive by the Jurchen and died in captivity. Uh, and so although under him the Imperial Painting Academy really flourished in this first part of the 12th century, uh, and in fact, you know, he was a great patron of the arts. He was um, actually included artists. He included a section on painting in the imperial um, bureaucratic exams and really elevated the status of artists to a kind of um, level of court official. So he was good for the arts in a lot of ways, but he wasn't a great emperor in other ways because, of course, he spent so much time on this kind of stuff that his empire essentially fell apart. Uh, Emperor Wei Tsung is also interesting because although the general trend, starting with the Northern Sung, where we see the development of um, Neo-Confucianism and this uh, sort of the, the institution of or the solidification of the bureaucratic exam system and in incorporating the scholars into the um, court system or the, the imperial uh, administrative system and we also see the developing ideal of the on the flip side of that of the scholar who retreats from court life and official life back to his country retreat this push and pull or yin and yang of the scholar official and then the scholar official who retreats from society is a kind of general theme in in imperial China except for during the reign of Hui Tsung who is not interested in that stuff and is not interested in uh, and is interested really in promoting really super realistic painting by really well trained court painters at the Imperial Academy or the Imperial Art Academy. Uh, Wei Tsung himself may have been the painter of some of the paintings I'm going to show you. He's traditionally attributed as the uh, the painter and writer of the poems that I'm going to show you, but it's not clear anymore whether that's really literally true or whether he simply hired people to make these paintings in a particular style that he liked. Oh, oh here's just a Wei Tsung's portrait done by a court painter in the style that Wei Tsung was, um, was most uh, drawn to, the one that he promoted, a kind of realistic, carefully detailed style. So he's the last emperor of the Northern Song, and he's most important as a patron of the arts and a promoter of the Imperial Painting Academy and for promoting certain kinds of painting within the Imperial Painting Academy. Uh, Wei Tsung is also known for the kind of calligraphy that he did. He was celebrated in some ways as a really great painter calligrapher and, you know, also sort of talked down as not a great emperor. But here is his style of calligraphy, and his calligraphy has the nickname Slender Gold. As you can see from this sample of calligraphy attributed to Wei Tsung, these are 
characters that are very precisely drawn, very elegant, with very with areas that are very thickly laid down with the brush, and then areas where you have the brush being lifted very deliberately and carefully off of the silk so that you have thick and thin lines, you have a very kind of sprightly, elegant, elongated, beautiful, clearly legible style of calligraphy, also sometimes called slender tendon calligraphy, to capture the feeling of sprightliness and um, um, energy that you see in this very elegant and very clear and very precise uh, calligraphic style. This giving of nicknames um, to particular individual style of calligraphy goes way back to the beginning of really personalized calligraphy in the Tang Dynasty. And although we didn't talk specifically in a lecture about this, you have been reading about this, I did want to show you a couple of the individualist calligraphers from the Tang Dynasty to give you a sense both of the kind of maybe meticulous personality that Wei Tsung must have been can, to create this slender tendon or slender gold calligraphy that's so elegant with this kind of spriggy energy to it, uh, as opposed to the calligraphy of the more individualist uh, uh, calligraphers who are also celebrated in Chinese history. So for example, here's Wei Tsu's autobiography. This is from the um, he did not live from 618 to 907. I'm sorry, he's a, a, a 8th century, 700s um, uh, monk who was known for his untrammeled and very free calligraphic style. And so here I've got, actually I've got these linked, I believe, from Blackboard as well, where you can see Hui Tzu's autobiography up close. Uh, and here is also just a, a sampling of it, this very free, very loose, very um, energetic, very casual looking style. Hui Tzu was um, known as a very great individualist calligrapher whose calligraphy is so individual and so quickly drawn and so um, expressive that it's even hard for native speakers and readers of Chinese to decipher some of the characters. Um, really the polar opposite of a guy like uh, Wei Tsung, who comes along and then has this very precise, very regular, very elegant script that's very clearly and easily legible. Wei Tzu was a monk who, a, a traditional, or, or as befits the kind of um, figure that becomes a hero in Chinese culture. He had withdrawn from court society. He was a drunk, and in fact, he liked to wait until he was quite drunk before he did his calligraphy because he felt that that would loosen him up and get rid of his inhibitions so that he would have the most expressive style that way. Um, really, again, the polar opposite of a guy like Wei Tsung. And Wei Tsung is in some ways a kind of um, anomaly in the history of Chinese painting with his precision and his interest in detailed realism, a kind of supra-realistic painting um, that's not like most of the history of Chinese painting. But anyways, here, here I think maybe you can get a sense of how different the personality of a Wei Tzu is as opposed to a um, Hui Tsung. Uh, here's Yan Chen Ching, um, his funeral address from a, ne a nephew. Again, this is an 8th century Tang Dynasty calligrapher who by the time of Wei Tsung is actually a very celebrated calligrapher. Um, also very individualist, very expressive. Here, Yan Chen Ching's, um, this is a draft that has become celebrated in Chinese calligraphy history because it's a draft of his eulogy for his nephew who had been killed during the Anlushang Rebellion. And um, during in, in writing this, he's writing about how his nephew had um, been captured, how his nephew was facing um, ex execution, and as you can see in his grief here, um, Wei, er, Yan Chenqing is so upset and so grieving over the loss of his nephew that, and so angry about what has happened. He's writing quickly. He's um, scratching out characters that he's messed up. He's writing um, in grief. You can almost see him if you read from the right to the left on the scroll. You can almost see him. You know, he breaks down. He gets himself together. He um, continues writing. He goofs up a couple characters. Uh, by the end of the scroll, you can see that the size and the, the coherence of the characters has really broken down. So you even get a sense during his writing of this eulogy how grief has affected him um, and how grief has taken over. And it's really like literally spilling out onto the page here. 
and there's a detail of the second half of the scroll so you can see where he's you know he's writing he's saying things like what a tragic loss my nephew was like orchid and jade and you know he's he, his loss is devastating to me right so you can see how with the irregularity of characters um, characters being scratched out characters being written very loosely and very quickly and in almost like he's blinded by tears how different that is from the the slender gold of Wei Tsung. Wei Tsung very controlled very elegant um, very very carefully modulated very precise you know and that's really Wei Tsung's calligraphy and his painting to a T the kind of painting that Wei Tsung was most uh, most interested in and that he sponsored in the painting academy is known as bird and flower painting literally because that's what you see in most of these paintings birds and flowers just like these monumental landscape paintings of the northern song you have in the northern song of course these ginormous paintings of grand vistas and very very you know huge sweeping um, monumental images where human beings are insignificant uh, the the thing that they have in common with these southern sung paintings is just this this interest in nature and turning to natural forms as a kind of metaphor for human existence and human life um, pigeon on a peach branch here this is one of the paintings bird and flower paintings where it's the kind of inverse of those monumental landscape paintings of the northern sung here you have a very tight view up close view of every detail possible of the individual pigeon and the individual feathers on the pigeon and um, the you know the branches and the details of each petal on the um, the peach blossom uh, you can also see some of White Song's characteristic slender gold calligraphy there, that very sprightly, spriggy, um, beautiful, elegant script inscribed on the right-hand side of the painting. Uh, White Song was known as a real stickler for detail, and in fact, he um, once asked his painters at the Imperial Academy to draw a peacock spreading its tail when the painters the story goes okay this may be apocryphal when the painters brought their pictures to him he said I don't like any of the work that you've done here uh, even though it was all very beautiful very meticulous every feather was you know it, drawn in great detail uh, but he said look you have all neglected to notice that when the peacock spreads its tail it usually raises its left foot and you have all painted the peacock with its right foot raised so in theory then Huey Tsung has spent so much time observing nature and natural forms that he was a real stickler for uh, incredible detail Okay. Let's see, here's White Song's Finches on Bamboo. Here again, it's just a tight close up view of a couple of small natural forms bamboo and bamboo shoots and leaves, uh, and, and then little finches, little tiny birds sitting on these bamboo branches with a little inscription in slender gold calligraphy there on the left, and then on the right is White Song's signature in that slender gold calligraphy, along with, as you can see, the seals of several different collectors who had owned this um, this painting over uh, the centuries. Here's a close-up of the finch from Finches and Bamboo, and here what I like is you can start to see how in these, um, these are not ink monochrome by the way, these are ink and color on silk. Um, here you can see in this little tiny, this is probably about an inch and a half of, of the painting blown up detail wise here. The finch with the individual, the variation in color on the feathers, the pattern on its throat, the, um, the texture of the feathers versus the texture of the new shoots of bamboo growing out here from the joints of the old pieces of bamboo. Uh, and also with that little dot of lacquer to indicate the eye of the finch that really captures that beady little black bright eye that you see on a tiny little bird here. Um, here again, making a study from nature meant to capture the spirit and the essence of the natural form, not just the visible reality. And there's a, oop, sorry. Okay, here's another detail from that painting where you can see again with just very very 
close attention to detail with the use of mineral pigment as well as um, ink on the silk. You have, with just a little bit of variation and shading and ink wash, can you see here how the, the joints of the old, bam, old growth of bamboo, then you've got new, young, tender shoots of bamboo coming out of the old joints, um, and that they've been rounded and shaded and modeled using very little modulation of ink wash in order to create the idea of new growth coming out of the old. Bamboo, by the way, became a common um, sort of metaphor for the um, idea of the scholar official. You bend in the changes of the wind, but you don't break. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here is a detail of a um, poem written by Hui Tsung in Slender Gold Calligraphy. So you can see here the um, very precise, very elegant, very controlled, very modulated and regular with lots of attention to detail, very much like the kind of painting that Wei Tsung sponsored in the Imperial Academy. And this is the uh, five-colored parakeet, the five-colored parakeet, which is probably the most famous of Wei Tsung's paintings. This is the other half of the um, the the scroll that I was just showing you, the five colored parakeet um, is a poem and then uh, an image of the parakeet sitting on a plum blossom branch. And here's a very close detail of the face of the five colored parakeet where you can see with just a few lines and some washes of color, Wei Tsung has really captured the um, the the correct anatomical detail of the parakeet. And here you've got the different colors of feathers. And this is, ex again, extreme close-up. This is probably a, about a centimeter and a half of actual silk that we're looking at here, blown up um, so that you can see the detail. And here is Wei Tsung's other kind of painting, bird and flower painting, one of the most important of the Imperial Painting Academy styles or, or genres of painting. And the other is this kind of court life painting. Wei Tsung himself is said to have made this painting, which is a copy of a Tang Dynasty painting. And this was, again, fairly typical of the Song, especially of the Southern Song, or the Northern Song under Wei Tsung. And that is a kind of um, art historical interest in the history of Chinese painting. So um, Wei Tsung was not just a patron of the arts and a patron of current painters, but he also was a collector who was interested in the whole history of Chinese painting. And he was very knowledgeable about and very um, educated on the whole history of Chinese painting. In fact, one of the earliest records we have of Chinese painting comes from the um, court of Wei Tsung because he had a catalog created of all the paintings that he owned and he was trying to create a record of the whole history of Chinese painting. This kind of art historical awareness of previous eras is something that is different in China than it is in the West and appears much earlier in China than in the West.